Good evening to all of you. Welcome back to a number of you and welcome for the first time to the rest of you. And to anyone here who doesn't have a church, you've been floating around DFW looking for a good one, well, welcome home. You can go here now. Thankful for the ministry of Pastor Tom and thank you for all of the pastors and the elders and your kindness and hospitality. Uh, my name is Costi and uh, I've been invited to both preach this morning out of 1 Peter and then tonight dive into uh, the prosperity gospel versus the true gospel or prosperity theology if you prefer not even to attach the word gospel to it because it's not really good news, um, but it's a, a sort of fake version of the good news. And we're going to dive into that. Um, what I want to do tonight is sort of seminar style with a bit of testimony and then we'll close with some brief exposition walking through Jude and verses 17 to 23. So if you want to turn in your Bibles there, that will be a good place to leave uh, your Bible open to. And then we'll walk through sort of those three segments. So first, I'll share a little background so you know why in the world I'm here, why I'm the one talking and not someone else. And then I want to give you some tools for your tool belt and explain why the prosperity gospel is so dangerous and really what the big deal is for people who may say, well, I don't really understand why it's such an issue, and so what, some guy's a big house, and so what, someone drives a nice car. So we'll answer those types of questions, but also for you who are believers and you're here and you've been evangelizing friends or you engage people on these issues often, I want to give you talking points. So you could picture this for a broad audience to include a bit of evangelism, a bit of background, a bit of the why, and something more compelling than just, oh, you know, bad guys drive nice cars, and then give you talking points. So you don't go to the coffee shop, and you don't grab some Whataburger, wherever you like to go, and sit there saying, well, well, well Costi Hinn said, and his uncle was Benny Hinn, and, and, and my pastor once said, and you know, that one guy, he has a big house, and I just don't trust him. I don't like his eyes. You need more than that. Much, much more than that. So I want to give you tools, give you your talking points for the coffee shop evangelism and or discipleship. If you're coming out of that world and you're where I was some years ago, uh, a night like tonight will help you greatly as you come to a better understanding of why you have been saved from something uh, so dangerous and so deadly and why it's incredible and why it is a miracle. All conversions are wonderful and great. They're all the same in the sense that we're all a miracle of salvation. Um, and some of us grow up in church and come to true saving faith while others are in a real mess. We're drowning and God pulls us out of some pretty dangerous beliefs. So we'll go there. Uh, let's pray and then we'll jump right in. Father, as I talk about uh, the storyline that really you've written and have to highlight some things about uh, myself and use personal pronouns, I want to make sure that uh, we're pausing for a moment to ensure that we put our, our minds and our hearts before you and, and me especially as I talk about things from the past, that it is all to bring you glory it is to talk about what you have done, uh, that I am uh, but a steward, a servant, a table waiter. That's what any of us are. We're stewards of the great mystery, which is the gospel. We are saved to serve. So help tonight. We need you. It's all for you. Uh, grow and challenge and equip your people. Help me to be clear and faithful to bring you honor through what you have done and then help us please to be mobilized, to go out and do something, to have the conversation, to be on mission, realizing that this right here is plan A, your church. There's no plan B. You're gonna use your church to showcase your manifold wisdom like Ephesians 3 reminds us. So may we go out not just saying what a neat story and you know, wow, a, a a bad guy turned into a good guy and we got one of them and all that stuff. No, it's not about us. It's not about even a, a, a branch of theology or beliefs that are aligned. It's, it's about nothing more than what you do and then what you call us to do. So help us to be faithful in that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So 
Uh, some of you know, some of you may not know, I am the, we'll get this part out of the way, I'm the nephew of Benny Hinn, okay? White suit guy, crazy hair, head offices in Grapevine. Uh, I grew up in the prosperity gospel in the center of it. That was my world and my normal. And the way that I, I would view ministry or church would be that church and ministry and all of that exist for my benefit and our family's benefit. And if you're the anointed and you are leading that sort of ministry, you get to enjoy the, the spoils of war. But you make a promise to people as well in that sort of theological system, which is if you have faith like us, hey, look at the proof. So it's a lot like a Ponzi scheme. The people making all the money are at the top while everybody else signs up, hoping to do it too, hoping to make it too. And I grew up in that world. Um, I genuinely believed that I had the true gospel. I actually understood the basic tenets of the, the gospel. I would just call it gospel plus. And how many understand if you add anything to the gospel, you've messed up the gospel? So gospel plus was, oh yeah, Jesus died for my sins. Oh sure, the cross and all that good stuff and Christmas and Easter and he rose again. But the real wow factor is that if you believe in him, well, healing and riches are a package deal, like a three for one. You get saved, you get healed, and you get rich. And God will bless you if you follow him. That is Christianity. And so you would tell a poor and hurting or sick person, hey, I have the solution to you. Jesus died to pay for that sickness and you don't have to sit there lost in your confusion and your brokenness. He will heal you. He will save you. He wants to prosper you. And you promise the American dream right out of the gutter if those stipulations are met. It's sold as a package deal. And I believe that. And I had no reason not to believe it. Everything that we did seemed to prosper. Crowds, packed stadiums. We had immense wealth, multiple homes. By the time I was uh, growing up in high school and then on into college, I had driven uh, Benzes and Beamers. I had a Hummer at that point by the time I came to school out here in Dallas. And at one point in California, I was driving a Ferrari F430, a red one. It was like lifestyles of the rich and famous. Just living the dream. And I would be asked sometimes from people, well, how, how, how do you justify this? Or how is this, you know, legal or even biblical? And I would often explain, well, this is what God does. It's your unbelief. It's your negativity. It's that self-righteous Pharisee spirit that is holding back your blessings. You got to let go with all that. We walk in blessing, we walk in obedience, we walk in power and authority and anointing and God provides all this. I was always trying to sell what we were doing and sway the crowd over into what I held strong beliefs to. When people were sick, there was one point in high school that I thought, well, we should go heal them. And I remember even telling one of my own family members, we should go heal this gal. She had cancer in my high school. And the response is, well, it won't work. They don't believe like us. And so I started to learn very quickly as well that a different belief system or not submitting to what we said would block someone's healing which opened the door for great spiritual abuse because how many understand you can control people's decisions quite easily when you tell them you better give enough money or you're not going to be able to have that baby. You better do what we say. You better follow the rules. You better not talk about the leaders. Don't touch the Lord's anointed is what we would often say. Touching the Lord's anointed meaning speaking anything. Even if a leader was lying or abusing someone, you never talk about them at all or you're touching the Lord's anointed, and therefore you're going to come under a curse. So the whole system is much like a cult. We sugarcoat it a little bit in today's world. You know, Scientology, well, that's a cult. You know, Mormonism, yeah, they're the weird ones with the Joseph Smith stuff. They're a cult. Uh, JWs, yeah, they're a cult. we got no problem with calling a lot of systems and theological beliefs cultish. But in our American context, the prosperity gospel and the churches who propagate it, including what I grew up in, we don't want to call them a cult. We say, oh, we, we can't really judge their hearts. Well, I, I, they, they seem like really nice people. 
You know, I think they're just a little bit off on a few things, but, you know, we ought to be known for what? What we're for, not what we're against. And we begin to mitigate because we don't understand the depths of the deception. There's also, I think, a bit of a, a comical culture, right? It's, it's, it's almost funny. I think we have to laugh sometimes because otherwise we would just be really angry all the time about it. So there's a comic relief to it. But also, some of the antics are so outlandish, like when a prosperity preacher hits the news and Comedy Central does a spoof on it because it's not reality. It can't be reality that someone actually believes this stuff, but they do. In fact, fives and tens and even hundreds of thousands of people attend churches around the world and right here, even in your own backyard, that propagate this sort of belief system. And I was in it. Well, in the goodness and kindness of God, I began to slowly become disillusioned by it, not because anybody did anything wrong to me, not because I was never afforded privileges. In fact, I was the favored. I even got to work for my Uncle Benny. My father was very successful in ministry. I was sort of the heir apparent in our family. Uh, you name your firstborn son after your father, and so there's actually four Costi hens. There's, yeah, one's enough. Ask my wife and my kids. But there's four of us. And that's because brothers have named their son after my grandfather, whose name was Costi, or Costandi Hin is my full name, and I'm the oldest. And so in a Middle Eastern family, when you're the oldest next generation boy, you are heir apparent. You are the one. And for me, I was prophesied over time and time again that the Uncle uh, Benny Mantle was going to fall on me. Like, Elisha and Elijah, that I was going to receive a double portion and have a great healing ministry that would outshine even his. And so I grew up all my life believing I was next. And at one point, I was playing baseball in high school. I wanted to go to college and play baseball, but my belief system would hold me back from doing that because I wanted to put God first. And so I remember a big dream of mine was to play professional baseball and I wanted to excel. And I grew up in Canada where you're supposed to play hockey. I played baseball, so I needed some prosperity theology to help me, if you know what I mean. And so I thought, I'm going to work for Uncle Benny. And I'm going to put God first. I'm going to put my life on hold. Like a Mormon going on a mission, I spent almost two years working for him, not going to college, and I said, I'm going to pour my life into this. This is my seed of faith. I'm going to sow it in the soil of his ministry, and then God's going to give me what I want. And so before you knew it, I was flying on the Gulf Stream, staying in the nicest hotels in the world. I've mentioned one in particular to give people a, a, a clear picture of what life was like. Uh, we spent a night once in the Burj Al Arab in Dubai. It's the hotel that's shaped like a big white sail. And we stayed in the Royal Suite. And the bill per night was $25,000 US for a night. It had gold everywhere. I remember there's a mirror on the ceiling in the room. The beds were round. You looked out over the windows and you just saw the ocean. Tiger Woods hit a drive off the top of the helipad once for Golf Magazine. I mean, everybody who's anybody was at this hotel, going to this hotel, and it was real. There was real brushed gold all over the place, tons of it, literally tons. You got picked up by the airport, finest cars, motorcades, and EP, executive protection, because we thought we were as important as the president. Uh, we would meet with kings, city officials, and athletes and those who own sports teams. I remember one year ending up at the World Series, sitting in whatever seats I wanted, watching my favorite players because the owner of that particular team and a few other large franchises really loved our ministry. And everybody was looking to get the same thing. Blessing for their business, healing for the body, salvation for their kids, and guaranteed what? Prosperity. Every area of their life, because that's what we sold. And so money flows in. Favors flow in. And so I enjoyed that world. My job was pretty simple. I would wear a suit and would travel. I'd carry a, a Louis Vuitton briefcase, and then I would catch people. I was a catcher. 
The kind of catcher that catches the people as they fall. You ever seen it before on TV? Faith healer touches their head and, and they fall down. And I, One job, very simple job. You can't mess it up. Don't let them hit the floor too hard. <laughs> and so there's a, there's a bit of an art form, seriously, to this. And you, you lay them down. And once in a while, you know, when the anointing's really strong, he'll yell, pick them up, pick them up, pick them up. And so you pick them up and everyone's flying all over the place. And sometimes you feel nothing and it would feel a little weird, but you got to act spiritual because you're on camera around the world. And so you kind of close your eyes and you mumble a bit as though you're speaking in tongues and you're really selling the show. Lines up the sick. And I never really thought about it back then early on that a lot of the healings are back pain and ringing in the ears and more back pain. And some people would limp across the stage. I never really understood uh, why that was problematic. I just thought, well, their legs haven't moved for a long time. Maybe they're a little stiff. The wheelchairs would line the platform. And I thought we were doing God's work. I remember one time even being at a hotel I called the Grand Resort Laganisi in Greece, just outside of Athens. Gorgeous hotel. Had my own suite. Had a pool. It was beautiful. Sitting there, private pool, looking out over the Aegean Sea. I have no clue that Paul sailed portions of the Aegean on real missionary journeys. But here I am thinking, I'm nailing it. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm just like Jesus. I'm just like Paul. I'm next. And I, I remember that moment so clearly because... It had been prophesied not long before that my time was coming and God was going to do great things. And I remember thinking, all I have to do is keep walking this road and I am next. I had no idea at the time that I wasn't preaching a gospel, anything close to the same gospel as Paul or even what Jesus taught. I finished my time with my uncle there's a few moments in there where I would call them cracks in the dam of my theology. They began to form. Different moments where I don't know what it was except that the Holy Spirit was doing His work and, and beginning to erode the foundation. I suddenly began to notice that there was this great degree of separation between shepherd and sheep or the faith healer and people. I began to notice that we didn't really nail it every time. Not everyone was always getting healed even though we guaranteed it. I started to notice that uh, children were still lying there in their stretchers. I remember one time my father in tears because uh, a baby was lying dead on a speaker in a third world country. There was nowhere to put the baby and so they were there to get a healing and there was nothing to do but put the body on a very large speaker and so they did. I remember various times watching people leave the stadiums. And nowadays, some of the prosperity preachers are getting exposed so much that they can't even fill so much as a hotel ballroom at a Hilton. But they used to fill stadiums. Used to come here to American Airlines. They'd go to the United Center in Chicago. Air Canada Center at the time in Toronto. I'd go different places and always got tours of the locker rooms because that's really what I was there for, just to have a good time. See where Jordan was and where different famous all-stars played. And we would fill the stadiums. And back then you could see the people leaving. And the healing lines would form. And I remember even one time there was a gal, a young gal, who was brought back behind the stage. Her parents were very high donors. I'd never seen a human body look like this before. Her face was very disfigured. It was very enlarged. And I wasn't sure what her ailment was. And she was on a stretcher and had short curly hair. And there she was. And I began to cry. And I didn't understand, even as a man at that time, what was happening inside of me and, and what was really happening in front of me. Is uh, There was prayers offered and nothing happened. And I saw many troubling things in all my years. I saw many people not get healed. I saw some things that were suspect. But overall, that moment stuck out in my mind. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I went back to my hotel and I cried like a little baby into my pillow, wondering why. And I was asking God, 
bawling my eyes out. Why? Why didn't she get healed? Why didn't that work? I mean, that's backstage, high donor. It's go time. You heal her. This is the moment right here. Didn't happen. Needless to say, you forget so quickly, and I'm, I'm sorry to even say this still, that when your posterior hits the leather seat of a Gulfstream jet, and when the Bentley rolls up and the driver's there to pick you up, and when the Louis Vuitton suitcases are loaded in, and you hit the five-star restaurant for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're off to the next destination, you might cry one night like that, but the next day it is so easy to forget. So coping mechanisms became a trusted resource for me. You just file it away. And suddenly, very oddly and ironically, the sovereignty of God comes into play. I remember asking at times, why don't some people get healed? And behind closed doors, the answer would be, well, we don't have all the answers. Our job is to just promise people what God does and offer them the hope. And sometimes he just doesn't do it, but we're not God. Meanwhile, in front of the cameras, we promise everything. But even the leaders aren't sure when things don't happen. Uh, From there, I do enter uh, a a school in Orange County and then eventually find my way to Dallas Baptist University to play baseball. As I get here, I drive a Hummer. I have the same rims as Sammy Sosa because why not? Uh, It's chrome package, TV's in it, but no one sits in the back, but that's what you do. And I roll onto campus of this Baptist school just to play baseball, and I was very arrogant, thought I was very anointed. I'd park wherever I wanted. Security knew me very well. The faculty was very kind to me, though, very gracious. Remember my first class, I was sitting in New Testament survey, and a pastor who was pastor in Burleson, Texas for many years, I was reading off the roll and he said, Costi Hen? I said, yes, sir. He said, you kin to Benny? I said, yes, sir, Texas twang. He said, all right, I guess I'll take it easy on you when we get to the tongues part. <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> it's a good sport. He said, I'm just kidding. Calm down. You know, and he, he calmed the class down. I visited various churches, and I found my church home. I went to visit Ed Young at Fellowship, and that was a concert, so moved on. And I was told, well, you know, you're, you're going to go to Gateway. I mean, those are our people. Those are our friends. So I went to Gateway. I hung out at Gateway. Fit right in. Felt like I was at home, in my circle, same theology, everything I'm used to. So I go there. I remember vividly, even around that time, something called Project 114 was starting, the church was growing, and everything just seemed fine until my coach from DBU, with no real agenda except to put the truth of the gospel in front of us through discipleship programs, uh, began to just share openly the gospel and talk about who God is. And I remember one day, an explosive moment later on would come to fruition in my life. As he was sharing, we were having a scrimmage game on the field, and there was a scout there in particular to see a couple of the players that were high draft picks. And in baseball, they'll come to see high draft pick type players. And if you play good when they're there, they'll see your name will end up on a list. You might get drafted because somebody else drew a scout there to watch. And so everyone's a little nervous and wound up. And coach says, hey, guys, calm down. Everybody relax. Proverbs 21.1 says the uh, heart of the king is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns them wherever he wishes. Listen, God controls kings. He controls scouts. He controls your future. He's got this. He is sovereign. And I remember thinking, what? What are you talking about? He's sovereign. I'm sovereign. I tell God what to do. I name it. I claim it. And true story, back then, coach drove an older white Camry. So I'm thinking, I got a Hummer in the parking lot. You Baptist, you got a white Camry. I got a $10,000 watch in my locker right now, limited edition Breitling. And you, you don't even wear a watch. I mean, sovereignty. I know about that stuff. I'll worry about how to get blessed and how to get doors open. You know, you kind of just worry about coaching baseball. Arrogant and so called anointed in my mind. Years later. 
I'm at a church. I meet my wife who's nothing like me, not from a background like mine, blue collar as it gets. She drove a Yaris to save on gas. She put herself through college. My mother-in-law, my father-in-law, very blue collar, hardworking people. She asks questions very graciously that I usually couldn't answer biblically. And the Lord continued to erode underneath the foundation I had stood on so confidently before. Till one day, through a number of different circumstances, I end up at a church in Southern California, and, and the church was a little wild. We were a church plant, and it was sort of a tractional mega church church plant, and so we were doing all the tricks that we were taught to do. And finally, our pastor had just had enough, and he says, We're just going to preach through the Bible. So there's a thought. I said, all right, well, we'll do that, and we'll preach in John. And so uh, he gives me a commentary one day and says, Hey, you're up. You're up. You're preaching John 5. I got to go. So he's going on vacation or something. He gives me my assignment. He throws me a burgundy commentary. I've never seen a commentary in my life. And it's got this signature on it. A guy named John MacArthur. <laughs> okay. And so he goes, this will help keep the train on the tracks. You know, check it out. This guy did some commentary stuff. I'm not sure, but seems reliable. So I'm studying, and, and it's this actual Bible that I preach still from, and John 5, 1 through 17. And I remember making observations, and I'm scratching my head as soon as I start, and the Holy Spirit begins to work. And I think, well, that's, that's odd. You picked one guy out of a multitude. I thought you heal everybody, Jesus. Well, then verse 9 says, and immediately the man became well, took up his pallet and began to walk. Well, there's not limping. And it's immediate. You, don't, you didn't tell him, oh, just go keep exercising your faith now, brother. It'll get better later. That's odd. And then I got to the part where the Pharisees say, hey, who told you you could pick up your pallet and walk? It's the Sabbath. What are you doing? Verse 13, but he who was healed did not know who it was. Greek word ido, meaning to perceive, didn't even perceive who Jesus was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd. How did he get healed if he didn't even know who the man was? How did he have enough faith if he didn't even know who Jesus was? You got to have enough faith to get healed. You got to know who he is. You got to believe. You got to claim it. And so I thought, well, this is interesting. I got to figure this out if I'm going to preach it. And so I opened the commentary and it was over. <laughs> uh, MacArthur tees off in the way that only he does so often. And he begins to explain you know, here's a great example of the sovereignty of God in action. There's that word that my coach used to use. Here is Jesus. Healing a man, not because he had enough faith, not because he knew who he was, not because he did anything at all, but simply because he sovereignly chose to heal him. Sometimes people had faith. Sometimes Jesus was moved with compassion by them. But other times they didn't even have a clue who he was. And then he says, the cruelest lie of faith healers today is that the people they fail to heal are guilty of negative confession, unbelief. And my jaw was down, the tears started flowing, and it was done. In that moment, I don't even know what happened except that we know when God saves us, things happen spiritually that only he can do. Everything made sense, light bulbs on. I believed that. I taught that. That's what it all meant. That's why people didn't really get healed. That's what coach was talking about. He's sovereign. I'm not. He's the boss. I'm not. He heals. I don't. I had this whole thing wrong. And so I repent of my sin. I go and kick my pastor's door in. He hadn't left yet for the weekend. And I just unloaded and that was when it began. I lost my title. I was no longer a pastor. I was PIT, pastor in training. It's like being a pledge in a fraternity. It was just, <laughs> you're going to crawl before you walk and walk before you run. That's how God saved me. It was the Bible. It was faithful 
preachers who declared and wrote the Bible. I studied, served, was discipled, went to seminary, and the rest was history, if you will. It's the same thing with every person, though. God saves us, and then he what? He grows us. We come to a greater understanding, a greater knowledge of faith. And so I started to talk to my family and reach out, obviously, because I had the truth. And I started saying things like, hey, so listen, it's going to be a little shocking. Probably not going to like this much, but don't worry, I have a solution. You're preaching heresy. (laughs) You're not qualified. Look, and I pull out, not this Bible, but my brand new calfskin MacArthur study Bible. (laughs) True story. And I'm reading 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Free from the love of money. Okay. So, again, I'm going to bother you a bit, but you need to quit. You guys need to stop. You're not qualified. However, I have some friends. They're willing to help. If I name them, it won't go over well right now, but trust me when I say they would love to help you. And I'm ready to name, you know, Justin Peters, John MacArthur, Steve Lawson, R.C. So I'm going to name all all these guys that, you know, and it just doesn't go well at all. They're upset. At one point, threats come, physical and spiritual, death threats, cancer threats, sickness threats, assault threats, everything under the sun threats, mishap threats, all the, hey, I just hope your kids make it through this. I just hope you guys live through this. I just hope nothing happens to you. When you start touching the Lord's anointed, Kosti, and then we're in it. And the Bible became the backbone. And how many understand people don't often like it, but does that change our job description? No. Does it change the, the manual by which we go about our work and our labor? No. We don't alter the strategy and change the course. We continue on. Scripture becomes the bastion of truth. They have to run into that. They don't run into us. Their qualm isn't with me or you. Their qualm is with their Creator, whom they've rebelled against and exploited. They've twisted And one of the reasons why uh, people are so blind to the dangers of prosperity theology is how blissfully unaware they are of how anti-Christian it truly is. And I'll tell you this before we jump into these points and plow through those. uh, It's not as crazy as it used to be. It used to be TBN, right, big hair, and all of that chaos. It was so easy to spot, wasn't it? Well, they don't get on TV anymore and do you favors like Creflo Dollar and shouting about a $65 million airplane. Pretty soon, Kenneth Copeland will be dead. He's very old. You're not going to have him doing any more favors for you when he goes crazy on Inside Edition. It's a business. They're smart now. An entire next generation of teachers and leaders know how to brand a lot better. They know how to look less weird. And so guys like Joel Osteen are just going to continue to evolve. And when you look at movements like Bethel, that is a perfect example of a spin-off type of ministry. It's not going to be white suits and Catherine Coleman and flowy dresses and TBN. It's going to be V-necks and skinny jeans and really cool music. They have proven one thing. Oh, it's fine to try to infiltrate churches through preaching. It can be done. But the number one way to infiltrate every single church, regardless of denomination, is music. They have figured out how to get in everywhere. And so, yeah, you'll have a few you know, blow-ups like the Carl Lentz situation from Hillsong. But overall, they're going to look good. It's going to sound good. It's going to make people feel good. And all of a sudden, you may feel a little guilty or it might be easy for someone to say, whoa, 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 you need to be careful naming names. You need to take it easy here. Some of these people, you don't know them. I mean, look, he seems like a nice guy. And that is exactly what many of these modern day teachers have learned to do. They look back on the weirdos and said, we'll do away with all that, but we'll keep all the business strategies and we'll do it too. Satan is smart. He's been doing this for 
of your young earth, six to 10,000 years. But overall, we could all agree, right? He's been doing it a while. He knows how to change the strategy, and he has. But what hasn't changed? The gospel. What hasn't changed? God's word. So while the world essentially in his strategy goes off everywhere like branches, you and I keep coming back to the trunk of truth, if you will. So I want to walk you through some of these keys. This is what the prosperity gospel does no matter what. Number one, it distorts the biblical gospel. How? Well, in Romans 5, 8 through 10, Paul says, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Jesus. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's the gospel. Romans 3, 23 to 25. We read that sin is something we all have committed. We all fall short of the glory of God. Being justified then is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. Finally, if you want a comprehensive take on the gospel, you go to Ephesians 2 and look at verses 1 through 10. The gospel is very clear. Sin is your problem. Jesus is your solution. You repent, metanoia in the Greek, you change your mind. You go the other way. You were going south, now you're going north. It's a 180. You repent. You say, I want God's way. The only way you can say you want God's way is because the Holy Spirit has done something inside of you called regeneration, and all of a sudden you want it. Nobody wants anything to do with God until he does that work. That's Romans 3. Also, where the Bible is clear that no one seeks after God. Nobody wants God. No one wants anything good. So when people say, oh, I choose Christ. No, he chose you. And then after, you could choose him. And now, in immaturity and ignorance, until you're taught, you think you chose him. And that's fine. He'll teach you. But he chose us. And he knows us. And has called us. And so the way to be saved, the good news, is not God is going to make you rich. The good news is not God is going to heal you because you know what? You might not get healed. But he saves you. Not based on works. Not based on giving money. Not based on any of that. And I'll tell you this, the greatest lie that might be the greatest lie sold in this type of system is that these guys don't get sick. I'll tell you right now, there is a lot of sickness behind the scenes. And we worked very hard to keep it hidden. When my mother was diagnosed with Cushing syndrome not many years ago and doctors were concerned about cancer, I remember we had to hide it so intensely because you couldn't have Benny Hinn's sister-in-law sick. Conveniently after, it became a lot easier as the news broke out a little bit. Well, why wouldn't she get sick? I mean, Costi's her son, so that makes a lot of sense. You touch the Lord's anointed. See, you got to keep playing whack-a-mole with it so that you can sell the storyline. I've heard a wonderful brother say, never trust a faith healer who has to wear glasses. The prosperity gospel distorts the biblical gospel by making the good news all about you getting more stuff. Material goods are not at all attached to the true gospel. The good news, the proclamation, is salvation for your soul. The gospel is not about monetary gain. It's about the glory of God, not the glory of man. And so all talking points begin with a proper understanding that the gospel is that and only that. It is not gospel plus. It is the gospel. We're seeing the same thing right now with social justice and everything else under the sun. Everybody wants to attach something else to the gospel. The gospel is a message. And transformed people, saved people, oh yeah, they go out and do stuff. Most hospitals were started by Christians. Throughout history, you'll see Christians doing good works. Why? Not to be saved, but because they are saved. But still, it is the message of the gospel that saved them, and they go out and live saved 
lives. You're not going to get more stuff for being a Christian. In fact, you'll probably suffer, most likely. Number two, the prosperity gospel insults God's nature. It's not just a slight, a different theology in some minor ways. God is infinite. He is holy. He is sovereign. You don't name and claim anything from him. You don't demand he do it for you. You don't manipulate him. He's not a magic genie. You don't rub him right and get what you want. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. The prosperity gospel distorts the nature of God. It insults his nature. Teaching that God just wants to grant all your wishes. Equating him to an earthly father. You'll hear this all the time. Oh, as an earthly father, would I ever hold anything back from my kids? Never. Why would God receive what he gives by faith? He wants to give it to you. Everybody in their right mind who's parenting biblically knows you don't give a kid everything they want. Even an unbeliever knows that. Maybe from the old days. When even unbelievers parented with some backbone. The Lord is sovereign. His servants are ambassadors. If you are an ambassador, you do not reserve the right to change the message or alter the reputation of your king. So we don't change his nature. We simply say who he is and what he does according to Scripture. The prosperity gospel insults his nature. Number three, and this one's a big one, the prosperity gospel confuses the atonement. This is an essential doctrine. The atonement can be defined simply as what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He bore our sins. He conquered death, rose from the grave. That's 1 John 2, 2. To atone means you, you make a payment for something. You have made amends. Jesus provided that atonement, the redemption for lost sinners. He's the atonement lamb. He paid the penalty. The benefits of the atonement are eternal. That is why you are not in heaven yet, but you know that heaven's coming. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, are you in a glorified body yet? You got to say no. I don't care how much time you spend at the gym, right? No one is in their glorified body yet. You're going to get treasure in heaven for giving faithfully to the Lord and pouring into His work here on earth. You're storing up treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, Jesus taught. Well, where's your treasure now? Where is it? Where's your heavenly rewards? They're eschatological. They're not here yet. It's an end times promise. It's a then promise that you hold on to now. Well, so it is with the atonement When it comes to healing, not all healing is guaranteed now. But one day there will be no more sickness, no more tears, no more pain. We know that promise because Revelation covers that quite clearly. We know that in the end he's going to wipe away every tear. But right now, there isn't a person in this room, no matter what you believe or how strong of a Christian you are, that has not been touched by the pain and brokenness caused by sin in this world. The atonement is not a guarantee that Jesus paid for it. The only thing preventing you from receiving it is you. He paid for that sin and he paid for that sickness. Why are you still sick? That's the burden placed on sick people so often. Why are you broke? He bought you with a price. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he became poor so you could become rich. When contextually, if you just read the plain meaning of the text, Paul is talking about the lavish generosity of his grace, and so in the same way that he gave his life generously, so too you and I ought to be giving generously to his work. His grace is a model for you and I to give. That's not a a picture of prosperity and guarantees for us. We're going to be rich. And by the way, a side note is, How good does this work in an American context? Probably pretty good. That's why we sell it so well and export it to the rest of the world. But you know where this doesn't work? 98% of the world? The rest of humanity? Go tell all the people in India that. Go sell this in South America. Go to Africa. 
Go see if the same promises work. They don't. See, in a way, what is true in the Bible really does work. If you believe in Christ and place your faith in Him and you confess Him as Lord, you will be saved. Who He's called, He's chosen, He's predestined. He's given you a spiritual gift. Use it, employ it to serve others. Do the one in others, bear each other's burdens, walk in forgiveness, restore in a spirit of gentleness. All, all things that you can go do. All things that we see work when we walk in obedience. You can go do those around the world. You can live the Bible in its truest sense around the world. God can save anybody around the world. What doesn't work? Selling the American dream as though it's biblical. The atonement is a precious and essential truth that is to give us hope for the future. What prosperity preachers will do is they'll write checks with their mouths that their Bibles don't cash. They use and abuse the atonement. And worse, they abuse people in that way. It's a damaging lie that demeans something so perfect and true in the atonement. Number four, the prosperity gospel demeans Christ, the person of Christ. Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. Over and over and over again, the Bible expresses the glory of Christ as the be-all, end-all for the Christian. He's the radiance of God's glory. He is everything. You're not. He's the only way to heaven, John 14, 6. The sustainer of all things, Hebrews 1, 3. Without Jesus, even heaven would be hell. He is it. He's the centrality of all life and all purpose, of your salvation, of every blessing. If you had everything in the world but you didn't have Jesus, you have nothing. And yet prosperity preaching sells the abundant life not as your salvation, not as everything that Jesus is, but... Him as a means to an end, the way to deliver the goods to you. That demeans the Savior. Enough said. That's all it takes. Number five, the prosperity gospel twists the Scriptures. And so we begin to step into James 3.1 territory. Let not many of you become teachers, lest you incur a stricter judgment. Brothers and sisters, you don't want to win arguments just to show people that you and I are right because we got the right theology. You want to help to save people from some of the hottest parts of hell. You know, 2 Peter, all of 2 Peter chapter 2 and even Jude describes the utter gloom of darkness for false teachers. Understand. While the world is very interested in what will happen to dictators and rapists and murderers and the like, justice will be done for those who don't repent of their sin. But may we never forget that a false teacher who is unrepentant is heading for the depths of hell, the likes of which you and I could not even imagine. They twist Scripture a plight on James 3.1. It is a mockery of ministry. They are evil imposters who enter into churches. They prey on sheep and they deceive the unbeliever. They don't care about rightly dividing the word of truth. If Paul the apostle himself were still here, they would turn their back on 2 Timothy 4. They preach their own words, their own opinions, man-centered ideas. They tread a foot on the precious, divine, God-breathed word. And they use it as a tool for abuse. Number six, the prosperity gospel is motivated by a love for money. I don't even need to unpack this one, do I? Money's like a microscope. It'll show you everything going on inside of you. Isn't it interesting? Jesus constantly talked about money, didn't he? Always bringing up that which people hold on to so tightly The love of money is the root of all evil. The prosperity gospel is obsessed with money and material gain. Nothing good comes from it. 
We even see this when people don't propagate the prosperity gospel and they preach a true gospel. When you start loving money and loving the stuff and building your own kingdom and getting real into you, the end has begun. We see this when men fall time and time again. But the prosperity gospel is motivated by that. Perhaps there's a difference between a Philippians 1 pretense When Paul says, whether in pretense or in truth, so long as Christ is preached, there's some nuance there for motives and what have you when you're not really sure why guys are doing certain things. But when somebody is motivated outright by a love for money, they will twist whatever they can to get it. When greed drives them, they're willing to hurt people and do whatever it takes. Number seven, the prosperity gospel produces false converts. I will say it so you don't have to and I'll make no apologies about it. There are numerous churches that are packed in the DFW area with false converts. And that's not just a plug for countryside like we're the best and we got it made and we're all perfect. No self-righteousness there. I'm being serious. There are so many churches playing the American game. It is hilarious to me in a very sad and sorry way how close my past looks to some of the movements that claim to be anything but false. It is the greatest deception, perhaps, of our era, as churches look like safe havens, but they are little more than pockets of earthly hell where people think They're saved and they're not. They think they're being taught the Bible and they're not. They're being told that this is Christianity and it's not. They haven't even heard the true gospel, which is why people end up coming to a church like this or others preaching sound doctrine. And it's like they just drank clean water for the first time. You meet those people, maybe some of you are that person. I remember the same feeling. Is this normal? This is what someone does? Everything makes sense. I've been in church for 30 years, somebody recently told me. I've never heard this before. It breaks my heart. It ought to break yours. See, it's great to have, you know, great children's facilities and gyms and fun campuses, all all good things. We ought to give the church a home and invite the people of God, and church should be so wonderful and campuses so sprawling. You could spend the whole day here. You don't got to go anywhere. You just need more food trucks to feed you all. That is great. Yes and amen. But how many churches just stop there? I get them in. Let's have some fun. Send them home. Keep them coming. When the great crowds were following Jesus, he didn't make it easier to follow. He made it harder. In Luke 14, you remember the story? Luke 14, 25 through 35, the crowds are following. Luke even records, and great multitudes were following him. Why? He had fed them. He had casted out demons and he had healed them. Oh, who doesn't want to follow Jesus for free food and healing? Everybody will follow him when it's easy. But you go and stand in a pulpit or you go have that conversation at a coffee shop and you say what Jesus said after that crowd was following him and you watch the eyes glaze over. True believers want it. Many people don't. He goes on to say, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. you got to be willing to die to get over you. That is a very difficult truth. The prosperity gospel produces false converts, people that have never even heard or understood the true gospel. That's not a broad brush If Jesus were walking the earth, if Paul and the apostles were walking the earth, what would they find in our churches? Unapologetic truth or social clubs? A little more than a place where if you you get too strong, you hear this a lot right now, especially with the SBC convention and people speaking about this, that, and the other. You hear people say this, oh, I've heard what you're against. Let me hear what you're for, brother. By nature, Being against something helps clarify what you're for. I am against the fruitless deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. You need to make that clear. I'm against weak pulpits and imposters who invade the church for their own gain. Oh, I'm against that. You ought to be against leaders that don't 
conduct faithful ministry. We ought to be against a body of Christ that doesn't act like the body of Christ. It's okay to be against. Look at the New Testament. Nearly every letter in the New Testament calls out false teaching. Deals with it head on. False converts are produced when, when we don't preach the truth. When we're not faithful. That's why our mission is vital. Jesus is not done saving people. We're plan A, the church. He uses the church. The unbeliever comes into our midst, the sheep lost, then found. So why would we preach anything else but the true gospel? Number eight, the prosperity gospel overcomplicates faith. Overcomplicates faith. Faith is Belief, genuine trust. It is literally throwing yourself upon Christ. Faith is not a force. That's what Kenneth Copeland will teach you and a whole bunch of other word of faithers. And it's a force. If you have faith, you can get a lot done and get a lot out of God. Faith is a belief. You throw yourself upon the Lord for salvation. Faith isn't giving money to get God's love. It's not paying a fee for grace. It's not even going broke to get healed. You'll see some preachers say, just give all you need to give a sacrificial gift and then God will meet your need. The greater your need, the greater your seed. It's always clever and it always rhymes, but it never works. Any religion that says you need to do good works, give enough money, or speak enough positive declarations to unlock God's saving grace or abundant blessings on your life is a false religion. Why is it not okay to say that as often as we ought to? That's what we call cults. It's okay to say it. That is a cultish teaching. That's a cultish belief. You are not a real church. That is not biblical ecclesiology. You're not a real pastor. That's not the real gospel. That is okay to say. A generation needs to hear that. Because for 30 years we've been playing the purpose-driven church. Just hanging out. Keep them happy. Sort of a lifeway Christianity. Everything's peachy. No, it's not. Give a generation the truth it needs to survive in a hostile world. It will thrive. Tolerate what we have tolerated in the past and you'll watch an entire generation embrace it. We do not need to um, overcomplicate faith. It is not a works-based system. It is belief in Christ. Two more and then we'll wrap up here. The prosperity gospel ruins Christianity's witness. You might say, man, Costa, you're a little fired up there and going at everything under the sun right now. Here's the deal. You and I aren't here to please people. We are not here to propagate a denomination or to wear some camp name. We are not of Apollos or Paul. We are of Christ. If you cause people to stumble, if you preach a Christ that isn't the Christ of the Bible, if you preach a gospel message that is not the true gospel, you are ruining our witness. Do you know what they do to people who run on a baseball field or a football field? Make it onto ESPN, your buddies laugh, and you spend the night in prison. You can wear the jersey, you can charge the field, you can sprint out there, and you can juke security 16 times. The bottom line is, you're not a real player, are you? You don't belong. So what do they do? They tackle you, and they get you out of there because you're messing the game up. There's people so often that charge into the church They're not wearing the right jersey. They've invaded the field of play. They're messing up the real game. And they need to be called out as such. They're ruining Christianity's witness. Jesus said, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions in Luke 14, 33 to make his point that the worship of stuff is going to keep you from true salvation and that the worship of stuff or an obsession with it is not going to mark his true and genuine followers and yet the prosperity gospel makes so much of material goods. 
And so we ought to use our God-given authority to protect people and boldly steer the church into truth, not exploit and control desperate people, ruining the witness of the one whom we will face one day. And finally, the prosperity gospel abuses vulnerable people. There's a lot of talk today about justice. Let's talk about justice for a moment biblically. The irony is the same people that will propagate a a temporal justice right now, even a social version of justice, are many of those who abuse vulnerable people with their teachings. The prosperity gospel attracts those who are desperate. They're on their last limb. Also those who are looking to get rich. And then it attracts teachers and self-appointed preachers who are looking to get rich as well. What desperate and vulnerable and hurting people need is a shepherd. It's the same warning that God gave, if you remember, through the prophet Ezekiel, warning the shepherds of Israel. Strong words given that still ring true by way of application today. The church, God's people now, deserve faithful shepherds. Vulnerable people are being targeted by these churches. They have every dollar squeezed out of them. Meanwhile, many of their leaders, again, propagate uh, justice by putting a black square on their Instagram or raising a fist or saying it's not enough just not to be racist. You've got to be anti-racist. Meanwhile, they are exploiting the least and most hurting among us. It's virtue signaling to the greatest degree. Meanwhile, they say nothing as they empty the pockets of the desperate and the hurting, the single mother giving her last in order to get a better job so she can support her two kids in the inner city. Yeah, those people, the ones that apparently we're fighting for justice for while exploiting, that's what so many prosperity preachers do. I talk to many dear brothers and sisters around the body of Christ and even around the world. One of them in particular, a pastor over in Africa, who sees this time and time again. Conrad Mbewe, many of you know him. Faithful, faithful man. He is called the prosperity gospel uh, the greatest threat to his continent. We export this to great degrees, time and time and time again. But there is something we can do. I want you to turn over to Jude to finish. How do we discern when it is time to call someone an imposter and be a little more firm and when it's time to be gentle and put the sword away? How do we know when to cut and divide and how do we know when to soothe and to heal? How do we know what kind of person to be patient and forbearing with and then Who is the kind of person that you need to sit and open up your MacArthur study Bible with and tell them they're preaching heresy? This is a question that Jude answers for us there in verses 17 to 23. Let's read it, unpack it very quickly. I'm not going to preach another sermon. We're just going to walk through it and then I'll pray. He says, but you beloved, and that's after quite an extensive unpacking of what false teachers do and signs of their falsehood. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So sort of in a simple way, you remember who instructed you. You remember who you belong to. We're God's people. We don't act like them. We don't teach, serve, exploit, abuse like them. That they were saying to you in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Oh, there you go. In verse 18, now we know also those faithful leaders haven't just modeled faithfulness for us in the sense of ministry, but they told us this would happen, so we don't need to be surprised. People get so disillusioned that this is actually happening, but you look at the Bible and you realize, oh, this is exactly what the apostles said would happen. This is why ministry is not about Instagram followers and being an influencer. It's about shepherding the flock of God. There are going to be those who follow their own ungodly lusts. In verse 19, they're the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. You ever been called divisive for speaking the truth? Isn't it interesting that the Bible 
says the ones who cause divisions are the ones who are worldly minded. They're devoid of the spirit. True division separates people from the true gospel. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And here we go. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Okay, this is the wavering person. They vacillate back and forth. Well, I'm not really sure that he's a bad guy. I heard him preach a good sermon. I doesn't seem all that bad. Look at his smile. He's so nice. I watch him on TV. You know they gave away 10,000 turkeys to the poor this year during Thanksgiving. Come on, heretic, are you serious? He's a nice guy. Two weeks later, I cannot believe what he said. I think you're right. I really do. I'm coming around on this. Two weeks later. So I was watching this program and he was on there and they were giving away bikes to kids now in the inner city. I just, I can't get my, I'm I'm pretty sure he's not. This is the person that goes to Osteen's church but has a MacArthur study Bible in their hand. That person. Back and forth they go. And, And why does Jude say, have mercy on some who are doubting? Because they're the hardest people to be patient with. Because you just want to sort of hit them upside the head with that study Bible and go, I have been clear. You got it? Let's go. Enough. No more counseling for you. Are we done here? Have mercy. Those are the people you don't need to yell at. You don't, probably six or seven of these points, they don't need to come up. You don't tell them, you're an imposter, you heretic. No, you're, you're, you're walking with them. They're doubting. They're not really sure when God will open their eyes. I don't know. You don't know, but you are going to walk with them. You're going to be patient. They are your gospel project, if you will. You're there for them. They call, you pick up. You go to coffee, you meet with them, you talk with them, you walk with them, all the while praying for the moment where the light bulb goes off and it's for real. And you disciple them. And so you want to discern, is this person the the doubter? The doubter. He says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. We get two more categories. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. This is the deceived person. This I want you to picture is you coming in like the Coast Guard and you're dropping the rope. This is the coffee or the lunch where you go there. You tell them you are in a cult. I love you. I want to help you. Or we need to have a conversation here. Let me ask a few questions to HMU. Help me understand. So when he says this or she preaches that, I mean, help me understand, how do you navigate the fact that, you know, your daughter has leukemia, but you still believe this? I mean, I'm not saying that God's not good and and you're not going to get healed and no negative confessions here. Trust me, sister, I'm with you all the way. You know, you want to love them well, keep defenses low, but you are going in to save them, if you will. And when that moment happens, you're not going, well, see you next week. Let's keep chatting. They're not the doubter. They're the deceived. They are in the fire. You are going in to say, I want to rescue you. I remember one particular family member I did this to. It didn't work, but I did it. I went and she cried and I cried and I said, I love you. I'm here. I'm telling you, you're in a cult. Trust me. Move here. I'll figure out a way to pay for your bills. We'll get you a roommate. We'll figure whatever needs to be figured out. Don't go there. It's a family member of mine that was preparing to go to Bethel in Reading to work there and to be a part of it in order to heal from her brokenness. And I said, come to my church. We will help you. It's a rescue mission at that point. She went anyway, training to be a prophetess there, swept up into it, eventually coming here to work for Todd White at Lifestyle Christianity. A family in it. So when I th- say things like I'm saying, I'm not you know, talking like some guy on his high horse acting like I got saved and now I just yell at everyone. I, I got family working down the highway for heretics that I love desperately like you have friends and family stuck in this sort of mire. 
There are going to be moments where you go in, you drop the rope, and you say, you are drowning. Please grab hold. I'm taking you out of here. Let's follow Christ together. That is the deceived. You've got the doubters. You've got the deceived. You're coming on stronger with them. And then you have one final category. And you've got to discern what kind of person you're dealing with if you're going to use this one. And on some have mercy with fear. Hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. This is a mercy still. Like mercy on those who are doubting, but this is a mercy with fear. You know very well this is a person who is dangerous. Things are not going to end well for them if they don't repent. You have mercy and you're, you're scared for them. You genuinely have a love for their soul. You hate even the garment polluted by the flesh, though. This is a dangerous individual. They're very easily able to stain people around them. Stay around them too long, you start to smell like them. These are dangerous people. This is why you won't catch me having a steak dinner with my uncle. Not just going to hang out and shoot the breeze. Rescue operation for the gospel. Deep theological conversations possibly even some sharpening debate as you go through a few key tenets and go, you see where that doesn't fit, you see where that doesn't fit. These are conversations that you and I have with people in an effort to reach them, help them, and disciple them. But there is a whole other category that you are not just going in to hang out. These are dangerous individuals. You pray for them. But you do not spend time with them. You also never underestimate them. It's what you'll find very often even now with movements like Bethel and preachers like Bill Johnson who teach a completely different version of Jesus. They'll often teach that he was just a man in right relationship to God, not fully God. He says that in his book, When Heaven Invades Earth, on page 29. Then he says he laid aside his divinity on page 79. And what he's doing there is ensuring that an entire generation can say, oh, cool. So he wasn't God when he was on earth doing his miracles. He was just a man in right relationship relationship to God, that's right. So guess what? You can do them too. Then they charge tuition to go there to schools. That's why you have now a school in Fort Worth with Todd White and Lifestyle Christianity. That's why you have the Supernatural School of Ministry with Bethel. That's why my dad and my uncle and a few others launched the Signs and Wonders School of Ministry. You know everybody's got a school for prophets, miracles, and ministry now? And who are they targeting? They're targeting young people who haven't grown up in churches that have been feeding them steady diets of truth from God's Word, but those who are easy prey. That's the kind of dangerous person that Jude is writing about. And so you have mercy on them with fear. You don't play around. People will often call you a legalist because you want nothing to do with it, or they'll call you unloving. The most loving thing you can do is hold the line when it comes to truth in an effort to win souls. Love is caring about someone's eternal destination, not about temporarily pleasing the evangelical culture in America. I don't think for a second that uh, this is a soft church and that your pastors are soft peddlers. I do think you live in an area that is ripe for an army of Christians to go out and deliver hard truth with a spirit of love. And that's what I hope you're spurred on to do tonight as you consider not only the 10 talking points, but Jews' words. And I pray that the Lord would use you like he's used so many people in my life to bring me to a greater understanding of true saving faith. Thank you for giving me so much of your time tonight. That was long. You guys are troopers. Let me pray for you. Father, sometimes when we open your word and we talk about challenging things, it is a lot like Jude wrote in the very beginning of his short letter, that he wanted to just talk about their common faith. I certainly feel that way. I'm sure my brothers and sisters do. It probably would have been fitting to have some barbecue tonight and just fellowship. I'm sure a lot of people would just like to talk about the gospel and your kindness and your mercy and and all the good 
things, but like Jude, we are compelled now and again to talk about the need to earnestly contend for the faith. What you have delivered once for all that is so final and so complete that when someone dies, it's not the end. That eternity is so long, we ought to care now. Give us that heart. Arm us with truth. Let us be those that know how to wield the sword, and yet we are tender and loving, and the mission is salvation. Let us be those not simply seeking to win arguments, but we want to be soul winners, those winning people like Paul, that we might save some and win more. I pray you would raise up a generation, and in particular from this church, that are bold and unashamed, that are so excited to take the gospel to people who need it. They would be saved, and then people who love you so much and love the lost would be willing to walk through the mess of new converts and all of their odd theological beliefs and twisted views that you tear down and Christians would have job security, if you will, for an entire generation in this area as they make disciple after disciple, as you save soul after soul. May it be for your glory. We know that you'll do it. Please let us be a part, Lord Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen and amen.